Are you there, God? Because right now, I'm not really sure. I felt you before, but I'm starting to forget what it was like. Are my words falling on deaf ears? You performed countless miracles, but I haven't seen one. In your own house, your children were cut down at the hands of an evil man. Were you there that morning? It doesn't make any sense. I understand that a simple man like me couldn't begin to comprehend the master plan of the one who holds the world. But you said that you still care for us. How do I reconcile the pain of this world with a God of love? I feel like my faith is fading. Maybe that's why you're so silent. Speak to me, God. Show me you're real. Let me hear your voice. It's been a while. We're continuing our series this morning on mind games. And uh, I wonder if you've ever had any mind games played on you before. Somebody ever played mind games? And, and we talked about this a little bit last week, and, and I put it in your notes again, that a mind game is a psychological tactic used to manipulate and intimidate. I wonder if anyone's ever tried to, to manipulate or intimidate you into doing something before. Well, I believe that we have an enemy that plays all kinds of games on our mind. He puts thoughts there, he puts doubt, worry, fear. We talked about fear last week and all the fears that we face and how this is a mind game to get us distracted, to get us down and depressed, to give us anxieties and worries. So the title of this morning's talk is, is I Doubt It. Because your mind is a battlefield, but one of the ways that the devil attacks us, you can put this in your notes, that the devil will attack us with doubt. But try to get us to stop believing. But put doubt in our mind. Now, now honestly, there's some things that we should doubt, especially if you're on the internet, right? I, I don't know if you guys ever, ever had this, but I'm very special in the sense that, that there is somebody in Nigeria that, that contacted me recently, and they have a lot of money that they wanted to wire into my bank account. All I had to do was provide them with all of my information, and, and it's great. It hasn't come in yet, but I, I'm expecting this week I'm going to get something like $20 million. It was a prince there, I believe. Anybody ever seen something like that? You know, or there's all kinds of, of, kind of hoaxes that go online. And, and, and I'm one of those kind of people that probably annoy other people because I like to fact check things. So people send things like, like oh my goodness, you know, they're going to be doing X, Y, Z in this country. And so then I just go and like spend like 30 seconds worth of research to find out, no, no, I'm sorry. You got worked up for nothing. Because I tend to doubt a lot of stuff that's on the internet. Some people have this mentality that if it's on the internet, it must be true. If it's on, if it's on the YouTube, right, you know, it must be true. Somebody's checking out this stuff to make sure everything on YouTube is factual, right? No, not, not so much. But I wonder if you've ever had a bout with doubt in your own life. And regarding your faith in God, your trust in God, your beliefs. Have you ever had to fight doubt in your life? I would venture to say that all of us have. Some of us maybe are living in doubt. You're, you're unsure. Maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you, you don't entirely believe that there is a God who loves you and cares for you. And, and you have that doubt. That's okay. 
Or maybe you, you have believed in God, but then, then you start to question, is God really there? Does he, does he really love me? I mean, how can he love me after all the bad things I've done in my life? How could God love me? How could God really accept me? You know what? I, maybe, I, maybe I believe that there is a God, but there is no way that God could forgive me. Man, if he only knew the things that I have done in my life, I just doubt that he could forgive me for all of that. Maybe all of this God stuff is just make-believe. Maybe there is no purpose to life. So we, we begin to battle these thoughts of doubt. Why should I believe in the Bible? Why should I believe that, that this is truly God's word? Is Jesus really the only way to God? I mean, that seems a little exclusive. There's a lot of other religions in the world and they say all kinds of nice things. Is Jesus really the only way? And why in the world did God create cats, right? I mean, these are things that theologians argue about. Why did God... I don't know if I believe in a loving God that created cats. And like, you know, every time I bring up cats, I have people start emailing me after like, what do you got against cats? And, and I'm going to be praying for you about cats. Well, I need some honest answers why God created cats. But for those of you that have been worrying about me, your prayers have paid off. I have a picture to show you. You have the picture? Oh, wow. this, this cat is at the farm where my daughter rides her horse. And every time I go there, this little thing comes up and finds me. I don't know how it finds me. And it starts climbing on me. And, and as cool of a person as I may be, I just don't have the heart to like shove it off. So anyhow, whoever's praying for me to like cats, please, please stop. Um, because it's causing me to doubt God. <laughs> you know, doubt comes at us all. Doubt comes at each one of us. In your notes, write this down, that when doubt comes, it can do one of two things. It can undermine our faith, or it can define our faith. What does doubt do in your life? When you're faced with, with questions, with issues, does it undermine your faith or define faith? If you've been in church for a while, you may have heard people kind of preach down about doubt. And if you express doubt, they say, well, all you got to do is trust God. Basically saying, just forget about your questions, stop asking questions, and just have faith. Unfortunately, most of the people in the Bible didn't just have faith. In fact, there's, there's a very specific person we're going to look at, a couple people we're going to look at today, but one is John the Baptist. You guys may have heard of John the Baptist before. Maybe you wonder why he was called John the Baptist. Was Baptist his last name? John the Baptist? No, it wasn't that. Did he go to the Baptist church down the road? No, he didn't go to the Baptist church down the road. There wasn't Baptist churches down the road back then. He was... Someone who baptized other people. So he used this, this tool of baptism. Now, baptism was a symbol of following something, of following somebody. When, whenever you would change your belief system in these ancient times, you would be baptized, symbolizing there's a transformation taking place in my life. So here's John the Baptist comes on the scene. Now, John the Baptist was actually prophesied about. Early in Scripture, in the Old Testament, in the beginning part of the Bible, there was prophecy that there would be a man that would come that would prepare the way for the Messiah. So here's John the Baptist, and, and, and he's, he's like a man's man. Maybe even like more than a man's man. I mean, he like his clothes were like wild animals. That I don't even know if he just like cut the head off and like pulled them over his body. I, I mean, he was like tough. He, he he lived off of wild honey and locusts. And, and I've heard people say, well, the, the carob pod is also called locusts, so maybe it was carob and honey. And as I dug deeper and deeper, I found that no, it was locusts and insects. So here's this guy. He's munching on locusts. He's eating honey. So he's probably got, you know, stung all over. He's wild. He's a little bit crazy. But he's out there in the wilderness preaching, preparing the way of the Lord. Now, interesting. 
interestingly enough, John the Baptist was also Jesus' cousin. So when Mary got pregnant with Jesus, around the same time, John the Baptist was being born. So he's a little bit older than Jesus. He's coming to prepare the way. And listen to what it says in John 1, 29. John's out there. He's baptizing people. He's preaching to people. And it says, the next day, John saw cousin Jesus coming toward him. And imagine your cousin saying this to you. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that would make a really cool family get together, wouldn't it? You, know, you show up and your cousin's like, look, the Lamb of God, you know? And that's what happens here. He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. How could he exist long before him? John the Baptist is older than Jesus. But because John the Baptist realized that Jesus was the Messiah, he was God who put on a human body and came here in the flesh. So John was the very first person to ever recognize the Messiah. And your notes write this down, that John also is the first person to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He's got all of his followers out there, and he says, hey guys, look, that's the one. In fact, at that point, many of John's own followers left John and started to follow Jesus. I mean, that would be a little bit disappointing, I suppose, but you're like, well, I'm kind of like the opening act. You know, you ever go to a concert, and, and they got the opening act, and the opening act is sometimes okay, but you're not there to see the opening act. You're there to see the main event. And so John was kind of like the opening act. He came and said, okay, guys, I'm going to get you ready. But the real act is coming on shortly. Jesus comes on the scene. And Jesus' cousin is the one who baptizes him. He baptizes him, and when Jesus comes up out of the water, Scripture says that the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove and lands on Jesus, and then a voice booming from heaven says, this is my son who I'm well pleased. And, and everybody's like, wow, this is crazy. I mean, if we were there, we would have been believers too. John was the first believer, but man, seeing all this, this would have been astounding. So Jesus begins his ministry, and guess what happens to John? John is arrested. John is in prison for denouncing King Herod because King Herod basically had an affair with his brother's wife and ends up getting married and whatever. And they're having this kind of illicit relationship and John the Baptist is denouncing him and Herod gets ticked off, locks him up and throws him into a dungeon. I mean, this was a, a, a horrible, filthy, literally like a hole in the ground where other people are. There's not sanitation. They're eating stale food, contaminated water. They're living in these horrible conditions. And, and here's John in this prison for denouncing Herod and his marriage to Herodias. Look what it says in Matthew 11. So John is in prison. And it says here, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard all about the things the Messiah was doing. So the Messiah, Jesus, was now going about, he was doing his ministry. And it says he heard about all the things that he was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, verse 3, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? There's doubt. There's doubt. Why is there doubt? I mean, well, how come this is the very first person to recognize Jesus was in, uh, was, was the Messiah, and here he is doubting already. And I wonder what was going through his mind. Why am I in prison? What am I doing here? What, what is the Messiah doing after all? I hear these rumors that he keeps going to parties, something about went to a wedding and provided everybody with wine. And, and he's going around, and he's, he's eating with people, and he's hanging out, and, and he's doing all these miracles as well, maybe. What is going on? I, I think John, as many people were, expecting the Messiah to come to liberate them from this evil empire that they were in bondage to. They were in bondage to, to Rome. 
And so John must have been thinking, you know what, what's going on right now? Why am I in prison while Jesus is out there? So I'm going to get my followers to go ask Jesus a question. Are you really the Messiah? Or should we keep waiting for someone else? And, and you know, let's write this down. Even people with strong faith ask tough questions in stressful times. And a lot of times we can look down on that. We can say, oh, you shouldn't ask questions. You shouldn't question anything. You need to have faith and not doubt. And if you have doubt, you're bad. And that's, that's just being oblivious to reality because all of us face moments of doubt. Here was John suffering unjustly. And honestly, it's not surprising that he wanted some answers from Jesus. See, Jesus, his actions as the Messiah was different from what Jews expected. They expected him to come in and take control of the kingdom. And all these reports that John must have been getting must have puzzled him. When is Jesus going to take the throne from Herod? When is he going to overpower the Romans? And here's John in prison voice what is taking so long? Why didn't Jesus go ahead and overthrow the government and let me out of prison? And, and I wonder if John maybe even had the assumption that in this new kingdom, maybe I'll even be an advisor or something. Maybe a governor, somebody important. I know I'm not the main event, but, but I was important, right? So things weren't going according to plan. And I wonder, do we ever start to doubt God when things aren't going according to our plan? We have a plan. Oh, I should be married by this time. I should have my degree by this time. I should be graduated by this time. I should have my first million by this age. You know, we have this plan, and then when the plan doesn't happen, instead of doubting ourselves, we start to doubt God. How could God let this happen to me? We expect something, but God does something totally different, and then we have doubt. And the devil, he plants doubt in our mind by accusing us. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are coming into church? Who do you think you are asking God for forgiveness? Who do you think you are giving advice to somebody, trying to encourage them in, in their walk with God? Because I know what you've done. Who do you think you are studying the Bible? Who do you think you are praying? Who do you think you are? You're not good enough. And the doubt begins to grow. Listen to what Jesus said to them in Matthew 11, 4. Jesus told them, go back and tell John, go back to John and tell him what you've seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk. Those with leprosy are cured, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised to life. And the good news is being preached to the poor. Now Jesus was subtly referring to prophecy here. Prophecy that, that he knew John would be aware of. Prophecy that said that Jesus or the Messiah would come and he would heal the sick and he would give sight to the blind and he would raise the dead. And Jesus said, go and tell him what you've seen. And then he goes on in verse 6 and he added, God blesses those who don't fall away because of me. John was probably on that borderline of falling away. Verse 7, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking to the crowds. Now, now, what do you think Jesus would say at this point? Can you believe this guy, John? I mean, he came out there and said, I'm the Messiah, and now he's doubting me. Man, don't be like John. He's, he's doubting me. Now, listen to what he says here. He says, what kind of man did you go out to the wilderness to see? Was he, a, was he a weak reed swayed by every breath of the wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No, people with expensive clothes live in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes, and he is more than a prophet. John is the man to whom scriptures refer to when they say, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth. Of all who have ever lived, of all the prophets of the Old Testament, of all the prophets, the Elijahs and the Elishas and the Jeremiahs and the Amos and, you know, uh, Malachi, and all these prophets that have ever lived, Moses and Abraham and David, of all these that have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. 
He goes on to say, yet in my new kingdom, even the least person is greater than he is. But see, here is Jesus not lowering his estimation of John, but he's building him up. John had, had doubts, yeah, and you know it's jot this down, but instead of dwelling on them, he investigated them. When we have doubts, do we dwell on them or do we investigate them? Because the longer we allow doubt to stay in our mind, the longer we dwell on the doubts, the more double-minded we become. The more we start to, to rock back and forth. Listen to what it says in James 1.5. It says, now, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. We need to ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter, it says, is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all of his ways. See, doubt is a mind game. The mind game to, to, to bring us off balance, to make us unstable. Is the presence of doubt bad? No, absolutely not. But do we dwell on the doubt or do we investigate it? John had the presence of mind. He said, I'm going to investigate this. I'm going to look into this. Go and ask. Jesus. Go and ask him, are you the one or should we keep looking for someone else? Write this in your notes. Doubt happens. Doubt happens. It happens to everyone. Say, but does it happen to you and your pastor? Absolutely. It happens to me all the time. I get doubt and when I get doubt, I have to fight that with scripture because I believe God's word is true. And I say, oh, well, God doesn't love you. God, God's not with you. Well, I believe what it says in Scripture that it will never leave me or forsake me. And I fight the doubt, but the presence of doubt is not wrong. See, doubt in and of itself is not the opposite of faith. See, doubt isn't the opposite. What the opposite of faith is is unbelief. Do we, have, do we believe in God or do we have unbelief? And doubt is simply wavering back and forth between the two. Wavering back and forth between the two. Now, I, I asked Anthony, one of our interns, to bring me his, his balance board. Now, I've never done this before. So I may die, okay? I'm just warning you. I, I should say I never did. I did it this morning. And I almost died. Um, but this is what it's like when we have doubt. I, I better hold on to something. I'm going to put the mic down for just a moment, so bear with me. In fact, there's someone in the Bible, and he's got a bad reputation. 
Maybe you've heard of, anybody ever heard, whether you come to church or not, have you ever heard of Doubting Thomas? Yeah. Doubting Thomas, right? Did you know Doubting Thomas is in the dictionary? It's like in there, like you look up Doubting Thomas, it's like a, a word, or it's not a word, it's two words, but it's a combination of two words. It's actually in the dictionary. This is the definition. Doubting Thomas, an incredulous or habitually doubtful person. An incredulous or habitually doubtful person. Habitually? Come on, we only saw him doubt one time. Give the guy a break. I, I mean, now he's the poster child for doubt and skepticism and unbelief. Oh, you're a doubting Thomas. You know, and, and, and my last name's Thomas. And like, oh, are you doubting Thomas? Like, sometimes I am. I probably have more doubts than the real doubting Thomas had. And, you know, I don't know. See, he, he, here's what he was doubting. The disciples came and said, hey, Thomas, while you were out doing whatever you were doing, because Jesus was dead, Jesus came to us, and he's alive. And Thomas is like, uh-huh. Sure. Now, I don't know. Was he doubting God or was he doubting his other ten disciples that were a bunch of knuckleheads? He's like, I believe God, but I'm not sure I believe you. And, and he said, in fact, the only way I'll believe if Jesus has risen from the dead is if I see him and I put my fingers in his, the holes in his hands where he was nailed to the cross and I put my hand in his side and I can see him. You know what? I can relate to this guy. I, can you relate to him for being a little skeptical when someone said Jesus was alive? I mean, we've all seen the news reports, right? Oh, Elvis Presley spotted at Starbucks, right? How many of you actually believe that? Uh, no, no, okay, maybe one or two of you believe that he, he's, not, he's not alive anymore. I'm skeptical, I'm doubting. Call me a doubting Thomas, but I don't believe that Elvis is alive. And Thomas is like, call me a doubting Thomas if you want to. But until I see it, I'm not going to believe it. And then a few days later, Jesus does show up to Thomas. And guess what Jesus doesn't do? He doesn't come and make fun of him. Hey, why didn't you believe Peter, man? Why didn't you believe him? Why are you always doubting? He didn't call him out. He helped him. He said, here I am. Here I am. Look, look at the scars in my hands. Look at the scars in my feet. Look, you want to stick your hand there? Be my guest. But I'm alive. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He's the first person that I'm aware of that actually called Jesus his God. He said, my Lord and my God. And he believed at that moment. And Jesus said, yeah, you know, it's great that you believe that you've seen it. It's even better when people can believe without seeing. But we call him Doubting Thomas. Did you know that, that according to history, Thomas left that area and he went to India, and in India, he began preaching the gospel, and there was a, a, at least seven, they say seven and a half churches, I don't know where they get the half church from, but they said seven and a half churches were started by Thomas. In fact, if you look at, at uh, uh, Kerala, India right now, the entire state is still Christian to this day because of doubting Thomas went there. If it wasn't doubting Thomas, it would still be uh, holy Hindu like the rest of the country is, but it's because doubting Thomas went there and he set up these churches and he preached to people. I know friends that their faith in Christ is, they can track it right back to Thomas for what he did. Doubting Thomas, not doubting. In fact, uh, some Islamic people at the end of his life came up to him and said, renounce your faith in Jesus. We don't believe you. Renounce it. He says, I'm never going to renounce it. And they held him up to a tree and impaled him until he died. Come on, doubting Thomas. It's like, you can call me whatever you want. Somebody said, oh, it's too bad that, that he doesn't have a book to kind of justify himself. I don't think he needs a book. I don't think he needs something. He's got a whole section of India that said, hey, man, we, we're grateful for Thomas. Call him whatever you want. But he wasn't doubting for long. He just had some questions that he wanted to have answered. In your notes, jot this down. That doubt causes us to focus on what we can't do rather than what on God can do. What can God do? Am I focused on what I can't do? Well, I don't think I can do this. I don't believe in God. I wanted to be a millionaire by the time I was 12 years old, and I'm not 
not a millionaire anymore, so I can't do that, so I'm going to doubt God. I'm focusing on what I can't do rather than what God can do. I can't, but God can. I can't overcome this addiction in my life, but God can. I can't bring the right person into my life, but God can. I can't, you know, make miracles happen. I can't heal the sick, but I believe that God can. What am I focused on? I'm focused on the fact that He is able. And we all experience doubt from time to time, but don't get drowned in the sea of doubt. In your notes, the last thing is that doubt should drive us to seek answers. To seek, if you have doubt, seek answers. If you're having a hard time believing in God and faith and all that, seek answers. There's a lot of great books out there. Lee Strobel's got a great book, Case for Christ. Uh, one of my favorite books, Here Christianity by C.S. Lewis kind of just really from an atheist standpoint says, here, here's what I've discovered. And, and you can look at things. It's okay if you have doubt from time to time, but don't just settle in doubt. Don't allow the game of doubt to be played out in your mind to such a point that it drives you to unbelief. Seek answers. Because it says in Luke chapter 11, verse 9, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. He doesn't say don't ask. Don't seek. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives. And everyone who seeks will find. And everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. When we have the doubt, are we asking? Are we seeking? Are we knocking? We're saying, well, I have doubt, so God must not love me, so I'm just going to fall into the trap of unbelief. I'm going to play the game that the devil is putting in my mind. I'm going to play the game. I'm going to believe that God doesn't love me. He doesn't exist. Maybe God isn't real at all. Maybe he hasn't forgiven me. No, I'm not going to put my faith in doubt. I'm going to put my faith in Christ. Ask, seek, knock. And do like what the band said. Don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. Because he is there. He wants to answer your questions. Just like John the Baptist says, I got some doubt, Jesus. He says, hey, go tell John that you saw the blind get their sight back. That you've seen a dead man come back to life. That you've seen the sick healed. That you've seen, more importantly, the gospel preached to everybody. Not dependent on how much money they earn, but the gospel was preached to them. So go and tell them that. Oh, Thomas, I know you got some doubt. But it's okay. Put your hands here. I still love you. I still love you. I, I still want you. I, 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 still, I still believe in you, Thomas. And I've got a mission for you. Don't doubt. Don't put your... Your doubts is the most important thing in your life. Trust in God. Let's pray to you. So, Father, we come to you right now. And we put our faith and our hope and our trust in you. Because we believe in you. And Lord, even when we face doubt from time to time in our life, we know that you're bigger than our doubts, you're bigger than our fears, you're bigger than our anxieties. And when there's these, these games, these mind games that come against us, we choose to trust in you. We'll ask questions, we'll investigate, we'll explore things. We, we won't just expect to to just go in blind faith. But we will have faith in you. And if you're here today, your faith level is pretty low. You've been living in doubt, not in faith. I would encourage you to take the step of faith today. God's word says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter
and we sing his praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand again.